to be up here with you guys. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's, it's a lot better coming up here in the springtime. <laughs> seeing the green, seeing the farm fields, and the beautiful skies. Uh, but I like coming up here anytime. Um, I want to begin with a poem from one of my favorite poets of all time, Mary Oliver. This is a poem called The Sun, S-U-N, The Sun. And she writes this. Have you ever seen anything in your life more wonderful than the way the sun, every evening, relaxed and easy, floats toward the horizon and into the clouds or the hills or the rumbled sea and is gone? And how it slides again out of the blackness every morning on the other side of the world, like a red flower streaming upward on its heavenly oils say, on a morning in early summer, at its perfect imperial distance. And have you ever felt for anything such wild love? Do you think there is anywhere in any language a word billowing enough for the pleasure that fills you as the sun reaches out, as it warms you, as you stand there empty-handed? Or have you too turned from this world? Or have you two gone crazy for power, for things? As we find ourselves moving towards summer, I'm struck by something in this poem. It kind of catches my attention. And that is, in the summer months, the way that the sun will find you. The sun will find you if you spend any time at all outside. See, I'm a very pale man. Right? <laughs> you can tell, especially after a long winter. I'm German and Irish and Polish. Those have to be the most pale people in all of the earth. And that's me. So every summer, the sun finds me. It finds me and it burns me. Right? But one thing that I'm really drawn to is this poem is, in this poem is the graciousness of the sun. The reach of the sun. How it just pours out this light on us without asking anything in return. It pours out its light and its beauty, and as Mary Oliver says, how it reaches out and how it warms you, even as you stand there empty-handed, right? giving nothing in return. You can bring nothing to a sunrise, and you can leave the richest person on earth. Right? The graciousness that we see in that kind of creation. And I can't help but wonder whether Mary Oliver is also talking about encounters with God. And not just any God in particular, but the risen and ascended Jesus Christ. The risen and ascended Christ. The one who rises to meet us in our empty-handedness. And shines his light on us. And I love her question to the reader. Right, that question right in the middle of the poem. Have you ever felt for anything such wild love? Easter is about getting the church back to that wild love for the Son, Jesus. S-O-N, Jesus. Getting back to that wild love. The risen Jesus with wounds in his body that are the very proof of his love for us. And, and we are standing there empty-handed, receiving a gift we can never earn. This is what Easter is all about. Recapturing that wild love in us for him. The love that actually gives us life. Right? As we come to the Gospel of John, I want to look at one truth that kind of helps wake up that love in us. That wakes up that wild love, and that's this. Jesus meets us where we are, and he is never far away. Jesus meets us where we are, and he's never far away. So first, Jesus meets us where we are. Now look with me at verse 19. Now this verse says everything about the disciples' state of mind right now. On the evening of that first day, and my translation is a little different, but John writes this, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now the disciples are terrified absolutely terrified. They just saw their 
best friend and their teacher murdered, and they believe this man was God, and now he's nowhere to be found. So they're starting to believe this was all for nothing. And they're hiding out in this locked room for fear of the Jewish leaders. Because they know when they look at the cross and they say, see Jesus there, if that's how the Roman authorities treated their leader, how are they going to treat the disciples? Not good. That means they're going to be on the cross next. At least that's what they're fearing. They had seen the wheels of injustice and oppression turn quickly and, and deliberately to snuff out the life of their rabbi in a blink of an eye. The man they thought was God. And they were not there for him. They weren't there for him. They did not defend him. In fact, they fled and they hid. When the Roman state abducted Jesus and, and sought to erase him from the world. So imagine the emotional atmosphere in that locked room. What, what kinds of things have you felt during the lockdown? Right? During the quarantine. Maybe some feelings of restlessness or uncertainty or fear or anger, all very difficult feelings. And every one of those feelings would have been amplified in this locked room where the disciples were. Wondering what the heck they're going to do. As difficult as our lockdown has been in this country, the, the disciples' lockdown is a special pain because it's self-imposed. It's fear-driven. It's a fearful, guilt-infused quarantine. And one can assume there's lots of shame in that room as well. Lots of shame and lots of fear. And shame always produces hiding. And that's what the disciples are doing. They're hiding. The door's locked for fear of the Jews. And they know they are next. And by the way, this isn't some anti-Semitic sentiment here from the disciples. These are all Jewish men themselves. What they're fearing is the authorities, the ones in power that killed Jesus. How ironic then that they are locking their doors for fear of the Jewish leaders, that the greatest Jewish leader of all history walks through the bolted door. <laughs> and there he is, standing right there among his disciples. And his first word to what some people might call backstabbers and betrayers, his first word to them is peace. Peace. Can you imagine that? The people that had turned on him. Have you ever really wronged someone? Have really gotten into a fight and really hurt them and you're in this big conflict with this person and you're angry at yourself and you feel guilty maybe for what you said or what you did. And that person walks into the room and even though you're the one that wronged them, they turn to you and they say, hey, I'm sorry. I could have handled that better. Right? And how that simple act of peace and grace can transform the emotional atmosphere of that room. You can transform the emotional situation that you find yourself in. See, Jesus Christ knew what kind of atmosphere he was walking into. And he knows nothing will change if he doesn't first restore the relationship. And so that's immediately what he does. What he does. And the disciples can't even scream in terror before he says peace to them. <laughs> you imagine a dead man walking into the room and he says peace before you can even react. Wow. And judging by the kind of power that Jesus has in his words, the same power that created the world, what that might do to comfort your heart and put everything at ease. And you feel his love in that moment. And this is what the disciples are experiencing. God is so much wiser and so much better and so much kinder than we imagine. His first word is peace. And he says, in effect, to the disciples, I'm taking it upon myself to restore this relationship. I'm going to blow you away with my kindness. I'm going to blow you away with my grace. And then you have to make sense of that. <laughs> and for prideful men, that's not very easy. Right? That's not easy to stick with that. 
I'm going to bring peace first and watch your pull yourself up by your bootstraps worldview teeter and collapse. I'm going to bring forgiveness first and knock you off your pedestal. See, Jesus doesn't just bring peace to restore the relationship. He does restore the relationship. And he wants to. But he also brings peace and unearned graciousness to us because that is the only thing that can knock us out of our self-important, self-centered lives sometimes. Unearned gift. Unearned grace. Right there. In fact, Jesus says this in the Gospels, if you remember. He says, treat your enemies, treating your enemies with kindness will be like pouring hot coals on our heads. <laughs> right? Because we hate being given, given something we can't earn. Maybe that kind of hurts us the wrong way. We want to pay for stuff. We want to earn it. We want to work hard for it. We hate being given something we can't earn because it means we are needy. It means we are in need of something. It means we really can't pull ourselves up our bootstraps, especially spiritually. It means we don't have it all together. It means we need forgiveness. We are needy people. We like to earn our keep. The only thing that blows that out of the water is unearned, undeserved grace. Like that kind of spirit. You can't earn it, you can't pay for it, and that is scary to all of us. I wonder if it was a group of us modern Americans in that locker room, whether we might want to write Jesus a check for his graciousness <laughs> and pay for it, try to earn it somehow, but no, he just gives it. This is just so built up in us, you know, how we're raised, how we live. I remember meeting with a patient in the hospital maybe a couple of years ago. And he was a really friendly guy. Right? He was in there for something, maybe something to do with his heart. Really friendly guy. He seemed spiritually, he seemed solid. And um, we had a long conversation, maybe 45 minutes, of just him sharing about his family, sharing about his work, how he's going to be all okay. And I was just about to end the visit. I was just about to end and maybe say a quick prayer for him and step out of the room. And the tears start to flow. And he starts to share about, you know, he's, he's disconnected from his daughter and how this is bringing so much pain into his life. And he doesn't know how this, this medical issue is going to end. And he's terrified. But it took 45 minutes to weaken the walls around his heart that he could recognize his neediness of it's not wrong to be needy. We all are. But it took 45 minutes of just chatting for, for something to drop and for the real heart to kind of come up to the surface. Right? We are taught not to ask for grace because grace means weakness. That's usually what we're taught. Easter teaches us that the, the, the thing that we need to reclaim is our neediness. Especially our neediness before God. We can't do it ourselves. We need help to be fully human. We need help. We usually like to be the helpers. We don't like to be those who are helped. But we need his peace to slip in and shatter that pride in us. To shatter those those personal lockdowns around our heart where we won't admit that we're needy. Peace is the first word, and it transforms the entire room. Now Jesus enters a room full of guilt and shame, and he utterly transforms it with one simple blessing of peace. He doesn't condemn them for feeling guilty or shameful, right? God does not waste his time making you feel bad. He's going to bring peace to your heart. Because you have a unique capacity for joy in this world. As human beings, you have a unique capacity for joy. And the risen Christ intends to fill that capacity with his love that, that blossoms into joy. First Thessalonians says this, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God 
in Christ Jesus for you. It doesn't mean we don't feel difficult things or that if we do, we're somehow not Christian. Absolutely not. It does mean that we have a capacity for true peace and for true joy. And that only comes through hearing his peace for you. For the real you, the personal peace spoken in the lockdown of your heart. <laughs> That's where true peace and joy comes from. And Jesus meets us where we are. But he doesn't leave us there. Remember, he sends out the disciples. He doesn't leave us in that lockdown. He doesn't leave us in that guilt. He tips over our fearful, self-protective worldviews by his word of peace. And right here, tonight, in this gospel, this is his word of peace to you. Peace be with you. That is God's first word to you. God meets us wherever we are, but he does not betray us by leaving us there. We will only find that true peace when we need him. Nothing else will do it. So Jesus meets us where we are, and he's never far away. That's my last point. He's never far away. Look at verse 24 with me and follow me. I'm just going to read this section. Now Thomas, my translation is a little different once again. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he says to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe him. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. When the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Notice the disciples are still in the locked room eight days later. We don't even know if they left it all. But they did see the risen Jesus. He came to see them. And yet they're still in this room. Transformation takes time. Right? Transformation takes time. This is kind of a freebie. It's not really part of my, my point. But be patient with yourself. And be patient with the people that you want to see befriended by Christ. Because even though they saw the risen Lord, they're still in a locked room. They're not really acting on what he said. They're just trying to make sense of it. Right? Transformation takes time. And Thomas is present this time. And Jesus shows up again where they are, and he actually brings more peace. Brings more peace this time. And Thomas has been given the unfortunate name of Doubting Thomas. Right? Which doesn't doesn't make much sense because he doesn't really doubt any more than the other disciples. Right? He sees Jesus and he believes, but unfortunately forever he has the name Doubting Thomas. But the other disciples were just as unbelieving. And Thomas, who gave up everything to follow Jesus, just as much as the other disciples, his own heart was broken when he saw Jesus die. We know that. You know, his, his heart was broken, his his future was shattered, he thought. And so when the disciples tell him that Jesus is alive, he says, uh -uh, uh not so fast. I'm not throwing all my eggs into this basket again. Okay. I believe this man is God. And unless I see him for myself, unless I actually touch his wounded body, I'm not going to believe. Right? And this is kind of a this is a common theme, even in our world today, right? Some of us have been so hurt by people. Some of us have been so betrayed by people that we can't open ourselves up to the possibility of God. And I get it. That's a hard thing. And Thomas is the same way. He's really being a realist here. He's like, I'm not going to dedicate my whole heart to this just to be shot down. I need to see him. And then Jesus shows up. Jesus appears to his need. And he tells Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas responds says, the only proper one, my Lord and my God. Now, isn't it interesting that the 
passage, passage doesn't say anything about Thomas actually touching Jesus. And I don't think Thomas actually touches him, even though Jesus tells him to. Because I think there's something deeper going on here, something richer going on here. You might imagine the thoughts of Thomas at this point, seeing the risen Christ. He may be thinking to himself, how in the world does this man know that I needed to put my hand in his side and I needed to touch the holes in his hands? How did Jesus know? And then the light bulb goes off. Jesus Christ was the one listening to his prayers. Jesus Christ was the one hearing his longings. Jesus Christ was the one was the one hearing his doubts and his fears. He was there the entire time. Right alongside Thomas, in all of his doubts, he was there the whole time. He was listening to Thomas's heart, and Thomas had no idea. Maybe it felt like he was praying to the air, but Jesus was close. He was never far away. He was utterly close. And Thomas says, this man is the one who I was praying to. This man is my God. This man is my God. You might remember the moments in The Passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson film from 2004. There's a moment in that film when Jesus is carrying his own cross. And his mother Mary is watching him, absolutely terrified. The face of Mary. He's watching him, and he actually stumbles at one point, falls to the ground, and the cross just kind of presses in and drives all its force into his body and kind of falls into the dirt. And Mary, who's watching him, his mom is watching him, and she has, she, a memory comes back to her of a little toddler Jesus running and tripping and falling in the dirt. And in her memory, she runs over there and holds him, comforts him, right, and lifts him up, and encourages him. And even though he's a full-grown man carrying his cross, his mother Mary can't help but run to his side when he falls with the cross. And, he, and she pushes her way through the soldiers, she pushes her way through the crowds, and she takes Jesus in, in, in her arms and she says, I'm here, I'm here. And Jesus just looks at her, with this love in his face, and he says, See, Mother, I make all things new. I make all things new. Almost as if to say, I know your heart. I know you're my mother. I know you want to help me. And I know you want to comfort me. But I'm doing something new. <coughs> I'm doing something new. I'm caring for you this time in a way that you could never even imagine. I'm giving you a future and a hope and an eternal relationship with my father. You cared for me when I was a boy. Now I'm caring for you and the entire world. I am doing something new. And Mary realizes, I think, <laughs> I think she realizes that she needs to let go because her son is taking care of her in a way that she cannot even imagine. He meets us where we are and he's never far away. And in you and me and in this world, he's making all things new. So I can't help but repeat Mary Oliver's stunning question with one small change from anything to anyone. I want to repeat her question from that poem. Have you ever felt for anyone such wild love? Because this is what produces that wild love in us. Only a God like this. Only a God like this.